Hi. Good morning. By Grace New Covenant. Don. Stifest. Dory. Gilbert. Blurdy. <laughs> Mendez. Darren. What's up, man? Paul. West Parlier. Hello, hello. Austin. JJ Lynn. Nolan. Sandy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good night. <laughs> Whatever part of the globe you are on, I hope you're having a great day, great morning, great afternoon. All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Yeah, it's hot here. You're 100 degrees in OKC. I'm just one state over in Missouri and it's hot. So hopefully my phone doesn't overheat. We will see how this goes. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started while we get loaded up here. Um, if you're new to my ministry, my name's Matt McMillan. I'm a Christian author. I've written seven books. All my books are available on Amazon. Check them out if you get some time. If you have read any of my books, I would greatly appreciate a review. Please go back to Amazon or wherever you purchase the book and leave a review. I have a podcast. The name of my podcast is Matt, excuse me, the name of my podcast is Walk Talks with Matt McMillan. I'm currently recording the latest episode live on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. If you enjoy YouTube, be sure to check me out there. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube. I'm not a pastor. I have no, no formal theological training. I'm a regular person just like you. The word pastor is only used once in the New Testament, and there's no list of qualifications or authority. So this tells us you have everything you need for life and godliness because you've trusted in Jesus. You don't need any honorific title. You don't need any bestowed, man-made name. You can just be yourself and talk about Jesus, write about Jesus, live about Jesus, and just be yourself. I don't know everything. I'm a regular person just like you who's learning and growing. A lot of ministries are set up on knowing everything, so I try to get that out in the beginning. I don't have every answer for everything. Sometimes I will even say, I don't know, <laughs> or I'm not sure, I'm still learning about that. We don't have to have the answer for everything. This should take all the pressure off of you when you listen to me. It also takes all the pressure off of me when I speak to you. Here's what we do need to know. Jesus. Once you've believed in Jesus by grace, you know him. Okay? He actually writes everything about himself on your heart and mind, and you're good to go. Now, from then on out, it's a maturation pro process. You are born again. You know, my daughter Grace, when she was a little infant, she was born from Jennifer and I. Was she complete in her identity? Yes. Is she still learning and growing? Yes. <laughs> Same with us when it comes to our new birth into the family of God. Our new birth to the family of God happens once, and then it is a lifelong maturation process. We don't get to different levels. You know, does Grace get to a different level of being my daughter? No. She's always my daughter, no matter what she knows, what she does, what she doesn't do. Same with you, because you've trusted Jesus. If you want to contact me, I welcome your interaction to reach out. Just go to my website, go over to the contact page, and I'll be glad to interact with you there. All right, so let's get to today's walk talk. Will Christians give an account? Actually, it's will Christians stand and give an account? You know, we've all heard it. Well, all, most of us anyway. <laughs> You've probably heard this. You've heard, we will all stand and give an account. Sounds scary, doesn't it? When you die, you're going to stand in front of God and you're going to give an account for everything, for the life you've lived, for both the good and the bad. And you're going to be judged accordingly. So be careful. How does that make you feel when I say that? Probably brings anxiety. Now, you could be listening to this, and that could excite you. You're looking forward to being judged 
according to what you have done. Unfortunately, there was another group listed in Matthew chapter 7 with the same mindset. And Jesus said, depart from me. I never knew you, even though they did all this stuff. And they were saying, look at all this stuff I did, Jesus. But Jesus tells them something very interesting. You never did the will of the Father. Many people will say, well, you, nobody can know God's will. You can know God's will. God's will is extremely simple. God's will, Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 49, excuse me, John chapter 6, verse 29, and also John chapter 6, verse 40. The will of the Father is to believe in the one whom he has sent. So if you're looking forward to judgment day and getting paid big time, because of everything you've done while on earth. Be very, very weary of that. I'm not saying you're not saved. You could very well just be struggling with the error of earning rewards in the next life. And I'm going to talk about that. But it's really simple. When we get into this topic, all we have to do is trust Jesus. How do we trust Jesus? We do the will of the Father. What's the will of the Father? To believe by no work of our own. Now, we were created to do good works. But those good works don't earn anything in heaven. Those good works don't prove who you are. Those good works simply edify the body of Christ. And it also shows the unbelieving world who Jesus is. Works are a good thing. But... Works don't determine anything in your next life. Also, works don't earn anything in your next life. Also, works don't prove that you're a Christian. And I'm going to talk about the verses today in questions. Because one of the number one attacks we get when we teach the new covenant, speak about the new covenant, which is Jesus, is... You're saying we won't be judged for our sins just because you believe in Jesus. That's hard, hard to hear in the new covenant camp because when we hear that, we can clearly understand this person who is saying that to us doesn't really understand what Christ has done. So it's sad. You know, I did a TikTok a couple weeks ago about judgment day. And I had three facts. I said three shocking facts. And again, I'm not here to shock anybody. But the facts that I do on this little mini-series of three shocking facts is shocking. The gospel shocking. <laughs> the gospel is very, very disruptive to the religious system. It was very, very disruptive to the religious system when Jesus was here. It's a very disruptive thing to the religious system now. It's very disruptive to the unbelieving crowd. It was disruptive to the unbelieving crowd back in Jesus's day. It's very disruptive to the unbelieving crowd this day. Why is that? Because it's not fair. It's not fair. What Jesus has done has made everything completely unfair. So often, because somebody has done something extremely heinous, we want to say they're definitely going to hell. They're definitely being judged by God in the next life for that because it's so bad. Our human mind and our own judgment system wants to put us in that judgment seat. Now, I'm not taken away from the terrible things that people do. I'm not saying it's okay. I'm not saying because we won't be judged for our sins, that we should sin away? None of that. I'm saying the gospel's not fair. We want it to not be fair. Why? We're going to get into that today. Okay. So will Christians stand and give an account? Yes, <laughs> we will. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 says, We will all stand and give an account.
for the good and the bad while done in the body. Now, if you just take that for face value, you know nothing about Christianity, you might even like that. Yes, when you die, you're gonna stand and give an account for the good and the bad. Me, when I stand and give an account, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna give an account for the good and the bad. Seems normal, right? <laughs> There's some huge context here. When you stand and give an account to God, if you have one thing bad, you will go to hell. And some people will say, no, your salvation is fine. This is talking about the reward ceremony that you're going to get. And I'm going to get into that too. Two different judgments. We're going to talk about that today. But I want to stick to 2 Corinthians 5.10 here for a moment. Because when I did that TikTok, I said, no Christian will give an account for the life we've lived. Only unbelievers. We give an account for the life Jesus lived. I think the views up to this is a, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand, whatever. It's just a really popular TikTok. It's been stitched more than anything else I've ever done. And the reason why is the unbelievers hate that. The unbelievers say, well, this explains why you guys are sh crappy people. This explains why sexual abuse happens. This explains why you think you can do whatever you want because you are not going to give an account. At least you're saying it now, Christian. So that's coming from the unbelieving crowd. The problem with that is they are judging us according to our faith and they don't even believe in it, but yet they're angry about it. So it really makes no sense when you look at it from that angle, but we don't want to attack them. We just want to let them have their opinion and we want to try to build bridges with them. Now this has been stitched so much on TikTok. I haven't even been keeping up with the stitches anymore. But it also got stitched by the, by the believing crowd. And the believing crowd pulled out the green screen for the effects. And they put 2 Corinthians 5.10 on their background. And they said, see, this, this Christian right here is lying. We will all stand and give an account for the good and the bad while done in the body. See? And I even had a couple of unbelievers do that too. We don't have anything bad to be judged for. That's the difference. Yes, every human who ever dies will stand and give an account in front of God. Good and bad. The difference is something that is bad, one thing that's bad, will eternally separate you from God. So Christians don't have anything bad to account for. Something bad is a sin. What has Jesus done at the cross with our sins? He's taken them all away. He's absorbed them in himself. He became sin so we could become righteous. John says in the book of 1 John, he is the propitiation for our sins. Now that's a fancy word, but the word propitiation simply means satisfying sacrifice. So if we stand and give an account for the good and the bad, but yet Christ was the full propitiation for our bad, then the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit are all saying what he did on Calvary was insufficient. So now you are going to be paying for some of that. We have nothing bad to account for. Unbelievers do. And it's not going to be pretty. You know, some of them are saying, well, this explains it. I'm looking forward to hell as long as I don't have to be around people like you. My friends, you don't want that. You don't want to be judged for anything bad. I don't want to be judged for anything bad. And the only way we could not be judged for something bad is if we're trusting Jesus by grace. Oh, you got to have a bunch of works. No, we see in Matthew chapter seven, there were people prophesying, casting out demons, performing miracles, but they never did the will of the father. They never believed. So the works prove nothing. The works edify the body of Christ. The works express Christ to the unbelieving world. That's it. Some people will go to James chapter two and say faith without works is dead. We have two different options with this. When we look at the book of James, 
we have to understand this book was the first epistle written. In fact, this is the first thing written after Christ ascended. This was even written before the book of Acts. And when we look in the book of Acts, in chapter 15 and chapter 21, James is still pushing the law onto people with the gospel. Now in Acts 21, it looks as if, and Paul almost got killed for this in Acts 21, and James was there pushing the law. James even told Paul, we like that you're going out and talking to these nasty, disgusting Gentiles, but we hear you're also telling them they don't have to follow the law. That's not true, is it, Paul? I, wa I want you to take this letter to them and tell them, you're wrong, I'm right. Go read it. <laughs> and of course, Paul didn't do it. Paul left. Paul came back again in chapter 21, and James is still pushing the law. Paul almost got killed. But James, the epistle, was written before Acts. This is why Acts is not doctrine. It's a history book. It's recorded acts of the early church. They were figuring this gospel out just like we do after we're saved. But just because they were figuring it out doesn't mean they weren't saved. There was Judaism mixed in. Paul had Timothy circumcised. But yet in the Galatian letter, Paul called them fools for being circumcised. So faith without works is dead. Works don't prove anything. And if we're going to the book of James and we're saying James is saying faith and works, but there's one option that James, am I saying he's not saved? No, I'm not saying that. Am I saying this doesn't belong in the canon of scripture? No, I'm not saying that either. I'm saying, look at the timeline of when James was written before Acts and he was still pushing law in Acts. And then in chapter 21 of Acts, it looks like he changed his mind after he saw Paul almost got killed over it. Okay, because Paul was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was a better Jew, quote, air quotes, than James ever thought about. So that's one option. Option number two, James lists two different people with a one-time act of saving faith, Abraham and Rahab. Does he list a lifetime of good works? No. Does he say Abraham did a bunch of stuff? No, Abraham put Isaac on the altar. What did Rahab do? Open the door for the spies who were doing recon work and got caught. She didn't have to do that. And she was a Gentile. But she believed God. So she let these Hebrew people out the back door. So she is listed as a, uh, a, a matriarch of the faith. As a Gentile. Works don't prove anything in regard to your salvation. Works don't earn you anything on your day of judgment. Okay, and we can also look at Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Romans 14, verse 12 is another part of many, many people who stitch. And if you don't know what stitch is, stitch is where you take somebody's video, you take part of it, and then you respond to it. So when somebody stitches you, nine out of ten times, it's somebody who's disagreeing with you. I get it. I'm fine with that. Some of them don't. Some of them agree. Somebody, sometimes people encourage, and I like those. But another passage that they stitched was Romans 14, 12. We will give an account for ourselves. Okay. We will give an account for ourselves. It says it right here. Romans 14, and they're pointing up on the screen as they got the green screen up with the Bible verse screenshot. Do Christians give an account for ourselves? No. <laughs> Jesus gave the account for us. So to get even more context, we can start all the way back in chapter 9 of Romans. So you got Romans 14, 12 saying we're going to stand. We, we will all give an account for ourselves to God. And they'll go to 14.12. Again, this is another case of versitis where you take one verse, you create a theology out of it, and not look at any of the surrounding passages, much less the whole context of the letter. The book of Romans was not written in chapters and verses. It was an entire letter. Chapters and verses were added later for easy referencing. So if you really want the context, read the whole letter. But if you want more zoomed in context, start back at the end of chapter 8, early in chapter 9. We can get the context. Paul was reaching out to his unbelieving Jewish kinsmen. Those who were still teaching the law, those who were still following the law. 
And he was telling them, you guys have been cut off. Your lineage does not cause you to be right with God. Your law observance does not cause you to be right with God. Instead, these Gentiles, and a Gentile is anybody who's not Jewish, these Gentiles who did not have the law, but have believed, did not work according to the law, they're good to go. You're not. You've been cut off. You can be grafted back in if you will repent from the law toward faith in Jesus. They refused. So Paul continued. This is why in Romans 14, 10, Paul says, why do you judge your brother and sister and hold them in contempt? Because they were judging everybody according to the law. Then he goes on to verse four, uh, uh, 14, verse 12. We're all going to stand and give an account for ourselves. Yet you are judging other people. Christians don't give an account for ourselves. Christ already did. On the cross, he was the propitiation. If we are standing and giving an account for ourselves, what Jesus did on the cross was insufficient. It is not a propitiation. It's a partial payment. But that's not the case. The cross was a huge success. He dealt with all of your sins. When the religious mind hears this, they think I'm saying, go sin. When those who have the mind of Christ hear this, they're like, what an amazing, an amazing, an amazing, an amazing thing. You go from being sin conscious to righteousness conscious. Okay. We don't stand and give an account for ourselves. Christ already did. When we stand in front of God and give an account for the good and the bad, we have nothing bad to account for. I'm going to get to the good here in a second. But really quickly, I want to jump over to James chapter 3. James says, not many of you should be teachers because teachers are going to be judged more harshly. And of course, this is a religious rebuttal that I get all the time because I don't walk around with a tie and I like ties. I'm not against appearances, but there's a certain appearance that the religious crowd, when I say religious, I'm saying those who are not really focused on Jesus. They could be Christians. I'm not saying they're not Christians. They could just be just struggling with this error of law, grace, mixture. We can never tell who is a Christian. So we can't say that to somebody who's sticking a needle in their arm, and we can't say this to somebody who is in charge of four churches or, or a church with four campuses. You can never tell. But for the most part, the stereotypical image that I have, which is being myself, you know, I, I, I'm a very active person, so, you know, I do most of my TikToks while, while I'm doing active stuff. You know, what I look like doesn't look like them, so when I say something, they will tell me, you're, you're going to be judged more harshly because you're attempting to be a teacher. I'm not attempting to be a teacher. I'm being myself. Whether or not I'm a teacher or not, I don't know. I have people tell me I'm a teacher. Whatever my gift is, I express that organically by, when I be myself. Honestly, you don't have to tell people what your gifts are. They tell you. So when somebody says you're attempting to be a teacher and James says a teacher will be judged more harshly, you shouldn't do that because every time you're wrong, you're going to be judged more harshly. That's, that's error. That's not true. What's the context behind James chapter 3 verse 1? Those who were teaching the law. If you do want to be judged according to what you teach... Teach the law as an unbeliever. If you're a believer and you're teaching the law, parts of it, you're still not going to be judged for it because that's the bad. You're not going to be judged for it. But you're teaching people which will grow fruit unto death. Poisonous fruit. Poisonous fruit. This is the ministry of death and condemnation, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3. So when you teach the law, you're not going to be judged according to teaching the law. You're just going to have to deal with your congregation's family your congregation and their families being, you know, in hiding and hypocrisy and posturing and factions and everything else, because you're teaching the law, but you're still not going to be judged according to the law. 
So when James said, you shouldn't teach, many of you should not be teachers because teachers will be judged more strictly. That's if you want to teach the law as an unbeliever. Okay. Now, let's go back to 2 Corinthians 5.10 because Paul does say, you will be judged for the good, the good and the bad. So I just talked about the bad. So what about the good? Yeah, we're going to get the good, Matt. You're really going to get the good stuff because you have done blah, 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 blah. I bet you're going to get lots of good stuff. Nope. That's not the good. <laughs> That's not the good. And I'm going to try to keep my emotions in check on this and not... Not really, you know, because this chokes me up because I just, I know how people want to earn stuff in the next life by doing stuff and you don't have to. Isaiah, the Jewish prophet in chapter 64 of his letter, he said, your best works are like filthy rags. So everybody who wants to be judged and get the good like filthy rags why because it's not as good as jesus period you cannot work to earn anything in the next life for good or bad as a christian everything good you've done it's like filthy rags Everything bad you've done, Christ has nailed it to the cross. Some people can't even fathom this. They'll say, nope, nope, we're, we've got salvation. But then in our next life, there's two judgments. There's the first judgment where God deals with the sinners. And then we go on to the next judgment, the second judgment, the Bema Seat. If you haven't heard this, consider yourself fortunate. And if you're hearing my words, you'll be able to answer it in the future. There's not two judgments. There's a great white throne. Yes, it's great. It's white. But it's not a second judgment. There's not two judgments. There's just one. They're getting this idea from the word Bema Seat. They say, yeah, here's the first judgment. The second judgment, that's the Bema seat. Christians are looking forward to the Bema seat. The Bema seat pretty much is like a reward ceremony. It's pretty much like the Olympics. You know, Mother Teresa, she's going to get the gold. Uh, So-and-so is going to get the silver. And then you're going to get the bronze. And then everybody in the stadium is going to cheer and one person is going to be on a higher level and you're here, you're here. And then you're going to get a really big mansion. And then you, you're going to be lucky if you even sneak into the Coliseum, but you'll still be saved. <sighs> They're basically saying grace ends in heaven. My gosh, if that isn't a lie, from Satan's own mouth. Grace does not end in heaven. It explodes in ways you can't even fathom. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither can it even enter into the mind of man what God is preparing for those who love him. And we love him naturally. Not by what we do. We have an incorruptible love in us. It is Christ in us. You know, even when I understood this new covenant message for a really long time, I still struggled. Am I doing enough to show you that I love you? Struggled with it. Knew I was saved. Knew there wasn't going to be, you know, anything bad for me in the next life. Knew that I was completely holy, righteous. I, I am not what I do. But am I just loving you enough, God? Is this enough? And then I read in Ephesians chapter six, I have an incorruptible love in here. It's an undying love. That means I'm a slave to it. It is who I am. 
I have love for God just the same way as I have oxygen in my blood. It is who I am. So there's not a second judgment. There's not a Bema seat. Who had the Bema seat? And where are we getting this idea from? It sounds really fancy and, oh, yo, yeah, the Bema seat. Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you'll have this reward. But then, oh, yeah, you, just, a, just, just the ones who really just had a desire to be holy. You know, you could really tell they were truly Christians. They will get the best spot at the Bema seat. Do you want that? Then you need to be like them. You need to take sin seriously. You need to A, B, C. And at the end of it, it is pretty much you need to be like me. There's no Bema seat. We don't need to be like anybody. We want to love them. We need to be like us. You need to be like Jesus. We are like Jesus. We don't need to be like Jesus. First John chapter four says, in this world, you are like him. In this world, you're like him. There's nothing you can do to be more like Jesus. That is what you are. Because you've been born again. You have a new identity. Just like grace could do nothing more to, to be more like me and, and Jennifer. That's who she is. She's a Macmillan. You know, do more stuff to be more Macmillan, Grace. What if I told her that? It would be silly. So when we have people on stage or on TikTok or on Instagram or on Facebook or wherever, tell you you need to do more stuff to be more like Jesus, that's error. You, that's who you are. You are like Jesus. You are righteous, holy, blameless. You're a new creation. There's nothing wrong with you. So mature, grow. So the Bema seat, back to this, the Bema seat was the judgment seat according to the Jews. That's what the Jews' judgment seat was called, the Bema seat. The Jews judge people according to the Bema seat. God doesn't judge us according to a Bema seat. And what were they being judged according to? The law. Okay, that's why there's no Bema seat in heaven. <laughs> Because we don't get judged according to the law. I mean, unless you're an unbeliever and you're teaching the law, we don't get judged according to a Bema seat. This is why Jesus said to these people in John chapter four, John chapter five, verse 24, whoever believes in me will not be judged. Whoa, what? We got to kill this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever hears me and believes me will not be judged, but has passed over from death to life. Why did he say that if I'm going to be judged? Because he was talking to the people who sat on the Bema seat. His audience was Jewish. You know, so many people try to put that in. Jesus says, I'm not going to be judged, but then it says we're going to be judged. What is it? Because Jesus was talking to the people who judged others according to the Bema seat. We don't do that. We don't get judged that way. Okay? All right, so there's not two judgments. When we, let me get away from this dog. Sorry guys, <laughs> give me just a moment. Normally that dog's inside, but I, I've walked by him before and he does not stop. So I'll just turn around. Once I get out of his view here, maybe he'll shut up. So will Christians stand and give an account? You know, we've gone over 2 Corinthians 5.10, both the good and the bad. We don't want anything bad. We, we won't be judged for anything bad because those are sins. We don't want anything good because our best works are like filthy rags. We are judged according to what Christ has done, his good. So we have no good, we have no bad. Okay, and then Romans chapter 14, verse 12. We will give an account of ourselves. Do we give an account for ourselves? Imagine that. Just think about that. You're standing in front of God and you start giving an account for yourself to God. I don't want to be standing there. <laughs> That's being judged according to the law because the context is judging your brothers and sisters according to the law. This is Judaism. 
Okay? James chapter 3. Many of you should not be teachers because we know teachers will be judged with greater strictness. Teachers of what? James opens up the letter saying, to the 12 tribes of Israel. Who are the 12 tribes? The Jews. Was I a member of the 12 tribes? No. Does James belong in the canon of scripture? You know, I get so many attacks by people who, in the Hebrew roots movement and people who still push um, law in with grace. And they say, James is not wrong. I'm not saying the book of James should be taken out of the Bible. I'm saying we need to read the book of James just like every other part of the Bible in the view of what Christ has done. That's it. Leave it there. Yes, it's on this side of the cross. Leave it there. You can still read it with your gospel glasses on. Just the same as you can read Genesis through Revelation with your gospel glasses on. Okay, there's nothing wrong with James. I'm not saying James is incorrect. I'm saying we need to read everything based on what Jesus has done. And works don't save. Works don't prove your salvation. <laughs> so when I talk about James, James is one of the most pushed letter onto people for those who struggle with self-righteousness. You know, and I say leave it. I'm not antinomian. <laughs> Antinomians say something's wrong with the law. I am actually saying the law is perfect, holy, right, true. Just like Paul did in Romans chapter 7, the law is perfect. But if you put somebody under the law, you will have sin afforded in their life. Sin afforded through the commandments. <laughs> so we have to count ourselves dead to the law. We have to count ourselves alive in Christ. Okay? So in the book of James, James chapter 3, teachers shouldn't be teachers are going to be judged more harshly because if they teach the law, they're going to be judged more harshly as an unbeliever. Yes. Okay. And then we also talked about two judgment seats. There's not two judgment seats. There's only one seat. <laughs> it's where Father, Son, Holy Spirit are all one. It's great. It's white. It's going to be as whiter than anything you could possibly imagine. Just like Jesus was, you know, transfigured. You know, <laughs> it's going to be big. It's going to be white. It's going to be great. But you're not going to be judged for sins because you've trusted Jesus. This is what you have to deal with. So when you sin, which you will. You have to deal with the fact that the cross took care of that. Deal with that. You don't need to lie about your forgiveness or have your forgiveness threatened or turn your forgiveness back into a work. You just need to deal with the fact that I'm forgiven. But don't just stop there. I'm righteous. This is not for me. So when you sin, it's going to allow you to realize there's no condemnation for me because I'm in Christ. Okay, I'm still struggling with it. There's no condemnation for me. So you can go a hundred years with that same loop that is still not greater than what Christ has done. You cannot out sin the blood of Jesus. You know, Hebrews 10, 26, if we deliberately keep on sinning, there's no sacrifice left but a fearful judgment. That's Judaism. These are the Jews who said, Jesus is not enough. I'm going to go to the temple to receive forgiveness by way of animal blood. We don't do that. They even trampled on the spirit of grace on verse 29. We don't do that. We have the spirit of grace in us. You might think when you sin, you're trampling on the spirit of grace. You're not. You're just sinning as a righteous person who is forgiven. This makes sin smaller. This takes your focus off of your mistakes puts it back where it should be, okay? So there's not two judgments. There's one judgment. The Bema seat was for the Jewish pro council. That's why Jesus said, whoever believes me will not be judged. This is why they wanted to nail him to a cross because they wanted to judge people on the Bema seat. We don't do that, okay? What about rewards? Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like everything you're saying, Matt, but I'm just really looking forward to some rewards. I know everything that I've done because I've gotten up early for many years in a row. The sun is still down and I crack my Bible open and I read a chapter a day and then I write about it. I might even post one of those verses on social media. I know I'm going to be rewarded for that. Or... I struggled with that addiction for years and years and years, and now I just stopped. I'm going to be rewarded for that. I tithed faithfully. 
I'm going to be rewarded for that. <laughs> I put up with so much abuse from my spouse and I never divorced them. I'm going to be rewarded for that. You're not. Oh, what do you mean I'm not? You're not. That's still filthy works. <laughs> because it's not Jesus. It's not perfect like God. Are you sure you read your Bible perfectly? Oh, oh yes, it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, I had a Bible reading plan. I even, I even used the blue highlighter on, on the, on you know the weekdays and the and the red highlighter on the weekends. And you should see my Bible. It's just beautiful. I have, you know, the whole thing is just highlighted. I got stuff written. And is it as good as Jesus? Well, no. Okay, so let's do it with the other things. What else? You you stop that addiction. Okay, but did you think about it? If you even lust, okay, what else? You tithed on your birthday money? Are you sure? Was that before or after taxes? Did you miss a day? You're going to be rewarded for that? Still filthy works? You stayed in that relationship because you felt like you were going to be rewarded in heaven? Did you resent them? Did you resent your spouse that whole time? Did you push all this church stuff onto your spouse to try to get them to treat you better? Did you use the silent treatment on your spouse? Did you withhold sex from your spouse? Did you not do the dishes because you knew that would really bother them, but you stayed married? Did you pit the kids against your spouse, but you stayed married right? See what we do? It's not as good as Jesus. Our best works are like filthy rags. There's no rewards. You don't get rewarded in heaven. <laughs> Did you know the word rewards with an S, plural, is not in scripture? When describing how we are going, going to enter into our next life. It's not there. Just the reward. The reward of the inheritance. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 24. You have received the reward of the inheritance. What is this reward of the inheritance? I've never heard of this before, Matt. Sounds strange. Okay. If you have a rich relative, they're filthy, stinking rich. When they die and you're in their will and you receive all of their riches, you just received the reward of their inheritance. The reward of the inheritance. You're rewarded based on somebody dying and you receiving their inheritance. Now, did you work to get your relative's inheritance? Did you do a bunch of stuff? Did you... Do more than other people in order to receive this reward. No, your relative had to die. They died. You got it in full. You received the inheritance. You were rewarded with their inheritance. The same thing happened to us on the cross. We have received the reward of the inheritance from Jesus Christ's death. That kind of echoed around here. Hopefully the, <laughs> Hopefully the neighbors don't come shooting outside but this excites me. We have received the reward of the inheritance. We've got everything right now in us, in here. Friends, it's a here. It's not stuff. It's Christ in us and through us and with us. And <sighs> It is the glory of God. You know, everybody, mm, don't even start getting triggered today, Matt. You're doing a great job. You're staying calm. <laughs> okay, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. So many people. <laughs> so many people. All glory to God. I see all glory to God on nearly every single thing I post. And I get it. All glory to God. All glory to God. All glory to God. <sighs> we received all of God's glory when we believed. Because we trusted what Jesus has done through his death. 
That is the glory of God. You have the glory of God. You've received the glory of God. You have the inheritance in full. Jesus says this in the real Lord's prayer in John chapter 17. The same glory you have given to me, I am giving to them. All glory to God. God has all the glory. Jesus died so that you can receive it. So that you can receive the reward of the inheritance. (sighs) Yeah, but Matt, I got bills to pay. He needs to reward me with financial blessing. He can do that. He's God. Why won't he? I don't know. But I do know he'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. Whether you're, you're filthy, stinking rich, you don't know what to do with all your money, or you don't know how you're going to pay your light bill. You can do all things through Christ, and contentment is in you because you have the glory of God in you, and you can deal with every situation you face. You can deal with having a lot of money. You can deal with having very little money. You can deal with having medium-sized money. That's not the glory of God. That's stuff. That's, that's your eyes fixed on earthly things. So you don't need rewards. You have received the reward of the inheritance in you. It is Christ in you and through you and with you. All your situations, you can tap into him. You know, we, we I was having dinner the other night at, you know, our, our local Mexican restaurant here with, with Jennifer and Grace. And me and Jennifer were talking about something and we were frustrated. We were frustrated about a situation, Jennifer and I. And, you know, Grace, she wasn't really involved in the conversation at all. She just, you know, eating her chips and cheese across the table from us. And (sighs) I am not getting choked up today. (laughs) Give me a second. Grace said, patience is the fruit of the spirit, dad. I was like, everything I was frustrated about just kind of melted away. And I was so stinking proud of what she had just said. Because Jennifer and I wanted this to happen and it should have already happened. We're talking about it and we're, you know, complaining. Patience is the fruit of the spirit, dad. And I didn't, I didn't react. She didn't know. She didn't know how freaking proud I was. I just looked over at her and I said, yeah, you're right. But that was just such a God moment for me. And the, the way she said that was because she has received the reward of the inheritance. She has Christ in her and through her. And she reminded me vocally, this is not a big deal, Dad. In the big scheme of things, patience, have patience. You have patience. That's the glory of God. That's the glory of God coming through grace. Me hearing it. It just edified me so greatly. And, you know, the rest of the night I thought about that. I was like, gosh, that was so good. That's the reward. Expressing Christ in us and through us. She, you know, she literally spoke. I don't want to say she literally spoke Jesus, but you know what I'm saying? It's a vine and a branch and she just expressed this supernatural fruit of the spirit and just bared it to me and I ate it and I was just like, this is great. (laughs) I love this kid and I love that she knows this stuff and I love that she just said that to me and I already knew it, (laughs) but I needed to hear it from her. You know, it was so good. It was so good. But that's the reward of the inheritance. You know, some people will want to go to 1 Corinthians 3 and they'll say, Paul talks about us earning rewards. That's, if you read all of, you know, they will say that 1 Corinthians 3 is Paul saying we are working here on earth to earn a reward in heaven. That's not the context of 1 Corinthians 3 at all. 
Read the whole chapter of 1 Corinthians 3. Please, if you think you will be rewarded based on what you've done, based on 1 Corinthians 3, this will just blow your mind. It has nothing to do with extra rewards in heaven. As a matter of fact, well, let me back up before I get to that, because that's going to make more sense when I get to it. 1 Corinthians 3 is Paul trying to create unity because certain people were obsessing over individual teachers. Hmm? Hmm? (laughs) And he's saying, I planted it. So-and-so came behind me and watered. So-and-so came behind me and watered it. But it is God who makes this grow. Not me, not so-and-so, not so-and-so. He was trying to take their focus off of individual people and put it back on this task at hand. He says, we are all co-workers in this field. The field is this earth and we work together. This isn't some kind of so-and-so has done more, so they're going to be rewarded more. So-and-so is going to be rewarded more. Some people who are up on stage think that. They think because they're on stage that they're going to get a big reward, but they're not. First Corinthians three is about unity It is about taking your focus off of individual people and their reward. If you really read this and read it a few times, the reward is people on earth. Everybody that we get to tell about Jesus, you guys are my reward. I get so much fulfillment out of doing these walk talks and, you know, seeing lots of people staying on here with me this entire time. It's so rewarding when I see the stats on my podcast. It's so rewarding. You hearing about Jesus is the reward. The people hearing about Jesus is the reward in 1 Corinthians 3. It's people. There's nothing more rewarding than this, in my opinion. We don't do this to earn a reward, but people, it feels good. You know, he even said the error that we teach, it will burn up like wood, hay and stubble. So everything that I say to you that is incorrect, that is error. When I enter into eternity, somehow I'll know that and it will be burnt up like wood, hay and stubble. You know, this is symbolic for all of your error that you're teaching. Even those in the law of grace mixture camp. All of that error that you're teaching, it's going to burn up like wood, hay, and stubble. This is not about being rewarded in heaven. It's an audience on earth. It's about unity. You know, sometimes... Sometimes I get overly passionate about individual people trying to take the rein and just act like there's not a group. And then it's all about an individual person. And sometimes I get triggered about that. And sometimes I I go a little bit too far in what I say. And I hurt people's feelings. And, you know, I don't mean to. But I just, I, I understand how people feel when they see that happening. Okay, so that's 1 Corinthians 3. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about one more thing before I jump off here. crowns (laughs) crowns <laughs> oh i like this stuff man this is some really good stuff yeah we're we're not going to be judged for the good or the bad jesus is already judged uh we won't give an account for ourselves only those who who are unbelievers and are teaching the law will be given an account and the rewards yeah that's cool too we're we've already received the reward of the inheritance and that's christ in us and through us and when christ died we received this reward in full because he died we didn't do anything to get it that's all great stuff but i'm looking forward to some crowns I'm gonna get a, I'm gonna get get a stack of crowns. My my crown. I'm gonna have so many crowns. I'm gonna have to lean backwards and, ugh, just to balance all my crowns. And then I'm gonna have on top of all my crowns, I'm gonna have just these best jewels, and they're just gonna stack on up. <laughs> you won't have crowns. <laughs> you won't have crowns. There's nothing that says you will receive crowns nothing. That's error. 
you know, there's really, and I'm going to get to some of the passages you're thinking of. There's some really good paintings that I've seen where, you know, <laughs> some people are, they're, they're, it's them in heaven and they're on one knee and Jesus is putting a crown on their head. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you're not going to get a crown. <laughs> when we see the word crowns, plural in scripture, it's only listed once in Revelation. And what happens with those crowns? The symbolic elders cast those crowns at the feet of Jesus. They cast the crowns. That's where the name of this band came from, Casting Crowns. We, we, we don't get crowns. <laughs> we do not get crowns. Jesus has the crown. He's the king, not us. We don't need a crown. Who gives a rat's crap about a crown? What do you need a crown for? You don't wear a crown now. Who gives a crap about it? Calm down, Matt. I'm gonna. You don't need a crown. You don't need a crown. And you're not gonna get a crown according to scripture. What do you want a crown for? <laughs> you know, we see a symbolic crown that you'll get in James chapter one, and it is the symbolic crown of life. And you have received it. You've got it. You got it through the reward of the inheritance when Jesus died. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, I'm working for that crown of life. Are you? Are you sure? How do you know? Hmm. Let's go back to that. No, let's not go back to that. It is a symbolic crown. <laughs> You're not going to get a crown. You've received the crown of life. The instant you trusted Jesus by grace. That's good news. <laughs> he is the king. Kings get crowns. Oh, well, we're princes and princesses. <laughs> Are we? No, we're not. We're brothers and sisters. We don't need crowns. Who cares? <laughs> How do you know you're going to earn it? Any answer is going to be based on I. If it's based on I, it's a work. If it's based on work, it's not based on grace. Therefore, it's not the gospel. That's why Paul said in Romans eleven six, 6, if it's based on works, it cannot be based on grace. No crowns, friends. <laughs> oh, you know, this might be really good news to you. This might be really bad news to you. <laughs> but I want it to be relieving. I want it to ease your mind. I want you to understand that the gospel means good news for a reason. All who come to him will find rest. You don't have to work. Even hearing that, you're like, eh. you don't have to work. Eh. Well, what's he saying? Eh. You don't have to work. <laughs> rest. From a state of rest, let God live through you. Don't worry. The work will happen. But it's not going to happen organically until you rest. And even if you're in denial for a hundred years, that is still not greater than the blood of Jesus. You cannot mess up the good news. Who do you think you are? <laughs> Blame Jesus. Deal with what he's done. And then figure it out from there. Work from everything that comes from him. Trust the vine. Be a branch. Live your life. Don't be afraid. Any Bible verse that creates fear, know that it's not directed at you. Let that be a rule of thumb for you. <sighs> so will Christians stand and give an account? Yeah. But when we stand, we're going to stop. Look over at Jesus. Beckon him over. Put our arm around him. Christ has given an account for me. Okay, you're going to get to see the physical Jesus and he's going to say, I got this one. That's my sheep. He knew me. I knew him. Don't be afraid. <sighs> so I hope this has encouraged you guys today. If you really want to see what it's going to be like 
when when you stand and give an account, read the parable of the vineyard workers. This is how it's going to happen. And Jesus gives this parable about a vineyard owner. And he began hiring people all throughout the day. Early in the day, he hired someone and he said, if you come work in my vineyard, I'll pay you this amount. Are you good with that? Yes. Okay. Get to work. So some started early. Then you had some people start around lunch. Okay. If you guys want to come work, I got so much work. I don't even know what to do with it. I'll pay you this much. Okay. Yeah, we'll work. They get to work in the vineyard. And then there were some people who showed up almost at the end of the day. And the vineyard owner was like, you guys still want to work? I still got more work to do. Let's go. I'll pay you this much. Are you good with that? Yeah. Okay. And they all went to work and they started at different times of the day. When the day was over and they all lined up to be paid, the vineyard owner paid everybody the exact same amount, same amount, same amount, same amount. <laughs> now the people who started early in the day, they got angry at the vineyard owner. Why are you paying them the same as us? We worked longer. We worked harder. What the vineyard owner say? Did you not agree to that payment? Are you angry at me because I'm generous? Take your payment, go. <sighs> Come on. That's how Christ, that's how God is going to reward us on our day of judgment. Everybody's going to get paid the same. It's going to be something we cannot even fathom. There's not going to be rewards. There's not going to be crowns. There's not going to be, you know, a ticker tape parade because we just, we got first place in the Olympics. Or, you know, none of that stuff. It is going to be something you cannot fathom. And it's going to be amazing. There are going to be colors you've never seen. Smells you've never smelled. Just sounds you cannot even describe. You're going to get to see your loved ones. It's going to be time. All sin and sinners will be gone. Time will be gone. Death, disease, mourning. Mourning literally in the, in the emotion. And also, the, the, there is no sun because the Son of God illuminates everything. Uh, it's just <laughs> when we stand and give an account and we enter into eternity. I don't even know what to say, but it's going to be good. So God's good. So eternity is going to be good. Whatever happens, I'm looking forward to it. Not now, of course. I got a little while. You know, I'm thinking mid eighties. I think I'll be done. That's, that's, you know, when I'm 85, I just, I, I like to check out, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> I'll go home when God's ready for me. So, all right. Always tell the truth about yourself. What's the truth? You're righteous. You're holy. You're blameless. You're a new creation. You're a child of God. There's nothing wrong with you and you are awesome. So always tell the truth about yourself. Always be yourself. Love y'all.